Okay, hello, um, my name is Donna Williams and I'm doing this video uh, about uh, how I came to uh, handle doctors and medical treatments <laughs> as a person with autism. So uh, I guess there are people with autism who never get sick and people with autism who are always sick and people who are in the middle and um, I'm one of the people who has had primary immune deficiencies since infancy so since I was about six months old I was dealing with constant infections and I was on antibiotics for my first 26 years of life and what that means is that I was always at the doctors I I, I got I guess, guess I got used to being handled from very early on uh, certainly by the doctor does that mean I engaged with the doctor? No, I mean, I, um, uh, I went like a doll, like a puppet. I dissociated, I stared into space and I, I left my body to be handled and uh, I would get back into my body later when people stopped handling it. Um, dissociation is very common in people who are subjected to a lot of medical treatments. Um, it's also really, really common in people who have uh, information processing disorders or sensory perceptual disorders who get extremely overwhelmed. And like anyone whose body is getting fried, whose brain is getting fried, we step out of it. We step out of processing what people are saying. We step out of thinking anything about anything. We step out of pain and what our body is experiencing we step out of uh, the active engagement with what people are doing uh, you know to, to your body so in my case uh, I had to have a lot of needles so I had to have um, I you know you couldn't give me uh, antibiotics as tablets so I just didn't don't really remember taking any tablets until late childhood um, which was vitamins, minerals and stuff, which I guess is, again, part of that whole immune deficiency world. Um, uh, so I, I was getting injections and I remember the doctor would always give me the old syringe and uh, it didn't have the needle in it and uh, I guess this would appall a lot of people now. But I was playing with this, you know, because he would, he would put the, the, the little cover on the end and then it would be full with air and it would go poop and it would go poop and shoot this uh, off and then I, I got used to how to make it go pop. <laughs> and so I'd go up the street pop, <laughs> um, popping the top of my toy syringe, my real syringe that the doctor had given me to go home and play with. <laughs> I guess that familiarised me with here comes the needles, I'm going to get a pop gun. Um, uh, so these days, of course, children don't get, uh, they don't get a syringe to take home with them, um, which is probably a good thing. Uh, as I, uh, as I got older, um, uh, and in going to the doctors, um, I guess I found things that I, that I liked there, you know, which books did I like, which smells did I like, um, uh, so I, I made my own little safe place <laughs> at the doctor's, my own little familiar place in the waiting room, you know. Uh, I'd look for the objects that I was used to, um, or that I recognised by smell, or by textures, or uh, stuff like that. Um, I, when I was... Uh, when I was about seven, seven or eight, I had uh, such recurrent tonsillitis that they decided to take my tonsils out, which of course are part of your immune system, uh, but mine was so inflamed basically I was choking on my tonsils, so off they went. And uh, as part of this and how they prepped me for it was um, my father used to suddenly grab me and throw me on his shoulders and run uh, in this shoulder rise thing, and of course I'd grab hold of him um, because I wasn't the kind of kid that would grab hold of anybody and so I guess this was his way of forcing interaction through a kind of rough and tumble, you know, uh, sort of indirectly confrontational in the sense that he, he didn't ask me or try to cajole me. He acted as if this was just part of his silliness, off his going and I was just having to survive. and. I got used to his uh, his kind of hit and run 
uh, small doses, always leave them wanting more, play hard to get sort of um, a way of working with my exposure anxiety because I was constantly avoidance, diversion, retaliation responses. So the only other alternative for me was dissociate and become puppet girl. So um, what he did was he must have told this to the surgeon. <laughs> so the surgeon and also anything that you did to my objects, to my toys, I would watch because I was very, um, you know, I, I, I felt that objects were, were people. They were my friends. They were. Um, so if you did this to an object, I would understand it. And he had got a doll and uh, that, that he'd found and... Um, He'd taken this along to the hospital and the the surgeon grabbed me, threw me up on his shoulders and ran me down the hall. <laughs> so, of course, I acted like, oh, here we go. This is just like my father. It's fine. And um, the doctor then put the mask onto this doll, uh, the, the anesthetic mask, and then he tried this on my face. So, of course, I was quite okay because I'd seen that the, the, the toy had had this mask. So, next thing I was here, then... Of course, I was anesthetized, and next thing I woke up with a sore throat, which uh, and I was at home. So this was quite normal for me as an immune deficient person. It's a lot more severe, I guess, because I had now had um, surgery. But I, I think that they handled it really well. Uh, as I got older, I really couldn't cope a lot with um, with the constant medication antibiotic thing of infections, infections. I really feared and hated infections as well. <laughs> and my response to that was to constantly act like I wasn't having them, which meant it was not easy. You know, I didn't uh, I didn't cry or go to, for help or anything like that. I had constant ear infections, chest infections, throat infections, um, constant sinusitis. <laughs> um, yeah, so um, what happened was um, by the time I was 26, I had a constant thrush, which is very painful, very itchy, um, uh, but I had this in conjunction with uh, constant infections, so recurrent lung infections that would always last around three months or more, very poor responder to antibiotics, bladder infections, eye infections. <laughs> this is normal with immune deficiency. Um, and there's a percentage of people with autism who live with immune deficiency. It's um, a higher rate than in the general population, uh, enough that uh, they're finding quite a number of results um, with a, a, a large subset of people with autism that they do have immune uh, anomalies or disorders. And certainly for me, a lot of my processing issues, a lot of my uh desire to leave the body <laughs> constantly was improved when the immune things were not as challenging and uh digestion was better sensory perceptual issues were less um when all the health things were addressed i have a salt wasting syndrome which means i can't retain my nutrients so i need to um, put a lot of supplements in to replace the things that unfortunately i just throw out um, and that's been confirmed through through testing. Um, so I have autonomic dysfunction if I don't put all those things back. So that's all right. So when I was 26, uh, I became immune to the antibiotics. I had to go through a lot of allergy testing, which was um, um, injections into my muscles to uh, look at the histamine reactions, um, lots of blood tests. So... Um, finding out what kind of antibodies I have to different kind of food issues. So, um, I have Ig, IgE um, allergies to wheat and all the legumes. So uh, finding that out was useful because I could go off the foods that were making me constantly ill. Um, I have a food intolerance to casein that came up in the muscle um, testing stuff. And I'm not talking about vegan testing there. It was the old style where they um they inject you and uh you come up in bumps <laughs> it's pretty awful um but there are uh less uh i guess the the taking blood and testing it for um uh, ige antibodies to particular 
uh, foods is, is an easier an easier test um, uh, so um, yeah I also had a blood test for different immune deficiencies what's my white cell count what's going on in IgA or what's going on in IgGs um, the IgG subclasses in particular I'm IgG2 deficient and then um, once I got older, <laughs> of course, it all gets harder. When you have immune issues, you, uh, your immune system breaks down ages earlier than it would for other people. Uh, I look at it this way. I am here because of medicine. Um, I'm one of the people that wouldn't be here if not for antibiotics. Um, and so if I'm 49 and constantly uh, having to get prescriptions or deal with health issues I guess uh, you know this is the life that I wouldn't have had so uh, what's the point of me complaining and yes I'm only 49 and I'm dealing with stuff that people in their 70s uh, deal with 70s and 80s certainly um, not usually before their 60s and that seems hard but I'm part of a new generation a generation of people we haven't seen a lot off yet because I was born in 1963. We haven't seen a lot of what happens to the the children who are on, who only became adults because antibiotics existed. So we're just learning what happens to these people's bodies now. And what happened to mine progressively was the immune deficiencies um, became more complicated. Um, I had cancer two years ago. Had breast cancer. Um, when I go to the doctors, uh, for years and years, of course, uh, they treated me as if I was stupid because I had language processing issues that were quite significant. I couldn't follow their instructions. If they didn't write anything down, it was all jumbled. I was always taking things the wrong way or cutting off doses too early or um, just not understanding why I've got to take things. Um, so. I didn't know how to advocate then <laughs> oh, and and in a way being treated like you're half crazy or half stupid or getting that little girl tone when they talk to you, you know, oh, hello, you know, can, can I do for you today and it's like oh please I do have a brain in my head, excuse me. So um, I guess uh, eventually <laughs> I learned um, and that was with the help of educational psychologist um, Laurie Bartek helped me in particular um, to explain myself to the doctors to and if I couldn't do it verbally to do it in typing so often I would hand them a letter I would hand them I give them a file I'd ask for copies of my records so that I could uh, know what I was asking about and uh, hand that to a new doctor um, I had, they, they would say things like, oh, you could never have been autistic, blah, 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 because of course now I can speak. And uh, and I would say, well, look, here's my early history and I'd take them uh, records and uh, reports and photos and they go, oh, okay, we've well, come a long way. And, and this sort of seemed to help them to differentiate between, you know, am I, am I crazy? Uh, am I some kind of disturbed person or do I come from a very different developmental history and I just can't organize myself or I don't fully follow what they're saying. So when I go to the doctors, sometimes I have to ask them to turn the aircon off so I can understand what they're saying. I had a doctor, couldn't accept that. I told her I can't process her language with the fan going. Uh, she, she couldn't accommodate that so I changed doctors. Um, I have to take a list with me when I go to the doctor because I, I, I go, my conversation goes like this, you know, a bit there, a little bit here, a bit this, a bit that, a bit this. And maybe I went in to find out about that, but I've talked about ev almost everything but what I wanted to say. And it takes a long time at the doctor's end and Often um, when I'm when I'm under time pressure, I, I can't talk as um, as easily comprehensible perhaps as when I'm relaxed. So uh, the doctors sometimes uh, don't fully know what I'm talking about, <laughs> or I take a long, long time to get to what I'm talking about. So I go in now with my checklist, and I felt really embarrassed about it. And I uh, I said, oh, I'm so sorry. 
I've got a list and they go, yeah, yeah, but you communicate better like that, Donna. So um, I go in, I, I have the questions prepared. Um, if it's, when it comes to feedback from the doctor, I, they have to write everything down, um, step by step and numbered. <laughs> if it's really important, like, you know, biopsy results or something, I definitely, my husband comes in with me and he notes what they're saying and what we've got to do about things. <laughs> but definitely getting written instructions back and going in with a list. Um, I, uh, I will sometimes take uh, articles in with me and ask them about it. Um, sometimes I'll email in advance and say, this is what I'm coming in to talk about. Uh, moving on to things like cancer because that's uh, a really huge level of medical procedures. So uh, basically I, um, I felt a lump. I figured, you know, maybe I don't have to do anything about this. I asked my husband, you know, what is this for real? What do I do? You know, he said, you've got to get to the doctors. And um, I went in, I had to go for a mammogram, which involves getting really, really squished. <laughs> They really squash your breast into these plates, and but it's really essential, and that saved my life because they said, "Okay, they don't tell you what's going on with you. You just got to comply and deal with it as best as you can." And that's where the early dissociation did me a favor, learning to cut off from the body, cut off from my mind, cut off from all feelings, and just let the doctors deal with the body. And don't worry about it. Let, you know that is really was really good in dealing with pain, the some of the pain associated with testing, and knowing I, I'm coming back. I'm coming back. I'll be back when they've done this. This is only going to take you know thirty seconds. This will only take forty five seconds. This will only take two minutes, and then my life is mine. Then my body is back. Um, losing myself in a spot on the ceiling. Uh, getting lost in a halo around a light, um, uh, buzzing on the reflection in somebody's glasses. Let yourself do all these other things. So then I had, um, when, the, when that was confirmed, I had to do biopsy. And with biopsy, I was awake. It's in a very strange room, lots of machines, <laughs> lots of noise, <laughs> lots of people, lots of cold funny instruments, you know, people finding veins, losing veins, trying again, seven times trying to find a vein, sticking me in machines to try and find a vein. And I guess um, becoming engaged with my body as an object and seeing it almost as the sculpture that we were both working on, that we had a problem to solve and I had to, you know, help. <laughs> In whatever way I could. Sometimes I had to help by just being really, really still. Sometimes I had to help by tuning, totally tuning out and saying, this, I'll be back, I'll be back. The pain is irrelevant. This is only a small pain. If you really want to know pain, let's, you know, let them saw your arm off. You know, <laughs> if they're not sawing your arm off, it's small pain. Um, so yes, biopsy, um, painful, pulley, you know, uh, very challenging. Later on after the biopsy then did the next confirmation and I had to have a lymph node removed. <laughs> that meant I had to get injected into my nipple whilst I was awake. This is the most freaky injection of my life. It was painful. Uh, it was really stingy. <laughs> um, yeah, I, um, but I'm here, I'm fine, I'm okay. And I think that's the important thing is to find what associations you can that are good. So here I am in the MRI machine, for example, it's like a big white donut. So I say to myself, I'm being eaten by the big white donut. Here I am going into um, this this room that, you know, this, this big white space. And it reminded me of when I was um, uh, six months to two and a half and looked after in the welfare centre. And everybody was all dressed in white and there was white sheets everywhere and white walls and white everything. But it was a really kind, predictable and safe space. So I let my mind go to that association, that I was safe. I was in the big white donut in this big white space. And so, yeah, they could inject, they'd just die into my nipple to 
find out what was going on in my lymph nodes and we achieved what we needed to achieve. Um, going into surgery, knowing you're going to get body parts cut off. <laughs> um, so I, you know, I was very, very shaky and, uh, but I had prepped myself about it and talked to myself about it and um, spent a lot of time with the mirror and confiding in me and self-parenting and um, finding clothes that were going to work with, with breastlessness. So went in, uh, the doctor was really great, uh, my surgeon was really great. Instead of um, taking me into, at first they took me into the uh, you know, the surgery area where they do the op and they delivered the anaesthetic there, but all the smells and noises and everything, the people, too many people, my body was quaking. <laughs> so the next time, because I had to get two mastectomies, the next time she did it much better. And this time um, I went into the, a really warm room, they put a really warm blanket on me and they came in and one was on one side talking to me and the other one, put the, the needle in as the other one's talking to me and I just went to sleep in this very gentle, kind of fairly normal little cubicle room. And then of course they wheeled me off, <laughs> I was out to it. And I woke up uh, in the hospital bed, very comfortable. But of course I woke up and I've got, you know, tubes and things. When I say comfortable, yes, pain, not uh, too overwhelming. Uh, but joined to a lot of tubes, <laughs> and I'm quite, um, I get quite uh, claustrophobic. I, I can't cope with the loss of autonomy and the feeling that I'm joined to machines. So I very quickly want to get out of bed. And in the, uh, there was a time where I pulled, the, <laughs> I pulled my, um, uh, my drip out and my blood started squirting and then I was pressure pressing on it to set my blood squirting and they had to come and fix it all up and and I I learned that if you want to avoid fuss you need to calm yourself down as all this crap's happening because if you if you panic and you pull things out and uh, you know you, you create much more problems for yourself so I learned again to keep practicing that rather Buddhist, self-calming, and practicing dissociation. Because there's a time where dissociation is really helpful. And with medical procedures, dissociation is really helpful. Um, so um, I then I wasn't allowed out of bed. My blood pressure was so low I would have collapsed. So they made me pee on the pan, which means that, you know, basically they lift me, put me back down, and I've got to essentially pee with people around me and half peeing on myself <laughs> as well and being quite you know I'm not fastidious but I'm clean and I couldn't cope and uh, letting yourself have a cry but letting pulling yourself back from overindulging in the cry because you've got to not go down into despair and always finding the silliness um, keep uh, keep in getting people to bring you the silliness, tell me a fart joke, send me some cancer comedy, whatever it is that makes you distracted from getting down deeper and deeper into self pity or fear, or don't let don't let that stuff eat you up, you know, because you've got to keep you you've got to keep grounded. So um, next thing to my shock i was having to go through chemo chemo um uh, i think for a person with autism is pretty full-on um it, you have to get all these chemicals injected into you that make you feel really ill but it's going to save your life and uh so it made my throat constrict um it made everything swell up uh i struggled to be able to pee and shit uh, there was a couple of days each chemo session where my swallowing reflex was really really slow it would take me about two hours just to drink a glass of water um, uh, I had a lot of autonomic dysfunction because I already had dysautonomia uh, I had already got um, central apnea and this progressed so I had to sleep with a machine so I now sleep with a machine that keeps me breathing because my brain 
loses the message it gets really weak and so I just go I just and there's no breathing um, it can be up to 90 seconds at a time and every around every three minutes so now I have to sleep every night with a, a mask again being a person with autism and noise I don't like um, I don't like weird noises and I don't like fan noises and um, I don't like things that are enclosing me and um, I don't like stickiness and there's a whole lot of stuff I really didn't like and um, I, I don't like icky tastes and I don't like icky textures but I have to do all this stuff because I've got to put all the nutrients back in caused by the salt wasting which is also causing the apnea and uh, I have to wear this machine or I'm going to get uh, really sick if not bring my cancer back as a result of oxygen starvation to my cells or um, cause myself a heart attack because of course my pulse goes really crazy when I am not getting oxygen and it's just a really really ill health situation there's no choice but what I did was I learned how to make really nice associations and I said I'm in despair I'm in despair help me I've got to make a good association with this machine and we went and watched Avatar and in Avatar um, uh, the guy goes, he, he's um, a soldier and they put him into this um, a pod and he gets in the pod and they put this mask on him, which is like my mask. And then it, it, it goes <laughs> and he then goes to sleep and then he finds himself in the land, which is Pandora. And in Pandora, he can fly and he's on dragons and he's, he's amazing. He can do all these things he can't do in his daily life. And, um, uh, and so I decided after seeing that that I would call my machine Pandora and I'd say I'm going to Pandora now and I get in I get to bed and I put them put the the mask on pull it over clip it up and it goes <laughs> and pulls back to my face and then it keeps shooting air at me and um with it's very it's not too loud but I have um, music that overrides it and is on a sleep function so then fades back out and my body has become so accustomed to the safety of the fact that this machine keeps me breathing that now a year later I don't it doesn't worry me I don't think oh this is in the way that's too much this hurts no I'm, I'm over it but and that's called sensory accommodation so it takes a long time but eventually if you can find enough good associations if you can distract yourself enough if you can self parent enough if you can self calm enough uh, if you if the people around you are not panicking and they reinforce all the positives of of what's going on for you and that it is your normal and if they uh, even celebrate it with you you know <laughs> and they try some of this stuff out and they normalize it for you you know you can live with it um, I can anyway and the fact is that if I don't learn to live with it I'm dead uh, so I'm, I'm okay about that um, I also have to wear a SOS bracelet which is um, because I have uh, Ehlers Danlos which is a vascular type that can cause sudden arterial bursts and organ bursts so it's um, uh, again uh, just a, one of those genetic condition things that um, they're finding more overlap in some people with autism um, uh, and I'm not used to wearing a bracelet and I don't like dangly things. I don't like anything that confines me. <laughs> but I got used to it. And um, uh, I think that's the thing is um, learn to pick your battles. You know, know what's worth fighting and know that sometimes the best way to fight is to challenge yourself to learn to live with things. And that means not just tolerating them, but befriending them, finding what the positives are, making some uh, associations, surreal, um, buzzy associations with those things and looking at what is your life in between and celebrating how, how normal your life still is rather than all the abnormalities of how your life has become. Um, I... As part of my uh, Ehlers Danlos, I developed spinal stenosis, which is degenerative. It means my spine, the use of my spine is um, deteriorating and it's pushing on a nerve in one of my legs. So if I 
aggravate this too much, I could potentially start to lose the use of one of my legs. And um, that began to happen uh, around December, about a year ago. And as a result of this stuff, I get a really horrible sciatica, it's immense pain <laughs> in my legs and uh, lower back. And I've had um, uh, these joint, uh, joint related, so, um, Ehlers Danlos is a connective tissue disorder, and that means tendons, joints, ligaments, muscles, um, uh, all those things uh, become uh, much more inflamed, uh, much more easily damaged, um, and in my case, more deteriorated much earlier. So um, uh, because the sciatica got so bad and I was ignoring the pain because I'd grown so used to pain, um uh, what happened is when you are ignoring your pain you can get this thing called a sciatic storm and it just started jabbing me and stabbing me with these pains so it was almost like a, having an electric thing of pain going around my torso and the result of this was my brain switched off the messages to my muscles in my um, lumbar and my thighs so i actually couldn't um, lift a leg i could if i went to the toilet i couldn't stand up if I laid down, I couldn't sit up because all the muscles here and the muscles in my thighs weren't working. For four days, they weren't working. So um, I could barely walk. Um, I could climb my way back up my body um, with, with my, my arms. I could push my way up an object, but mostly I was on the floor. <laughs> and I said, okay, so I don't know if those muscles are coming back. I'm gonna have to adapt. And, and I began Skyping with people from the floor. Uh, I began doing art from the floor. Um, I then had to, uh, I was not allowed to have a, a, a my, my normal seat at the desk. I have to have a standing desk. So here I am, I'm actually at a standing desk is where I type. And um, uh, so I also have a ring cushion on my seat at the dining table and have a ring cushion in the driver's seat and I take this around with me in a big bag so it's in this curry bag so which I stitch the top of so I can just take my cushion out put it somewhere and use it and then I'm not um, compressing my spine and contributing to my issues and potentially bringing the paralysis issue back and the pain issues back um, etc. And I, I think that uh, when we think of people with autism and all the, you know, can't do this, can't do that, afraid of this, doesn't like that, um, my health issues have kicked my butt, kicked my butt, kicked my butt, and then kicked my butt some more. And um, my job is to interact with that and say, how, be my own OT. How can I adapt to this? How can I adapt to this? How can I adapt to this? How can I... Um, include this in my normal life how can i continue my normal life uh, with this accommodation um, how can i advocate about what it is that i've got to manage and we we often talk about autistic children one of the problems is that the kids who've got significant health issues as they get older are going to be closer and closer to a range of um, conditions um, and progressive you know deterioration in different systems whether it's the immune system whether it's connective tissue whether it's um, uh, autoimmune disease um, uh, you know and, and I have to uh, I, I have a lot of immobility issues now so um, I have to take uh, anti-steroidal uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories for that I have to take daily antibiotics at a small level because I haven't, I'm haven't. i missing a part of my immune system that would let me fight encapsulated bacteria, but I can't. Um, I am on my anti-cancer medication, which causes a lot of side effects, but I can't come off it. I have to do um, uh, a whole lot of supplements several times a day because of the salt wasting condition. I am on a diet that's free of wheat and legumes, casein and sugar. <laughs> and is low salicylate because otherwise our various systems fall apart and i'm still really really glad that i'm here um in my old age of age 49 and 
I hope that those other people who are dealing with similar uh, learn to deal with it as the Buddhist, uh, as that Taoist who's always looking at what's the good side of this and um, who's always looking as an OT, how can I include this in my daily life, who's encouraging other people to help you normalise it, who is being your own comedian, finding the light and surreal side of what's going on, making an adventure out of it. Um, I hope that, that that's helpful. But certainly, um, uh, you know, getting a communication going with your doctor uh, and if you can't make verbal sense when you're there, put it all in a list. <laughs> if they don't understand your autism background, make an appointment to discuss that with them and get them to ask questions. You know, is there anything that you want to know uh, about about what I need and how this all works? Um, yeah, so um, and have take along an advocate if you need to. So I hope that's helpful. Thanks a lot.